everybody. Perfect. Thank you. We're back after an extended break. This time, we're tackling an incredible sequel. The original is the 1982 classic Blade Runner. It almost invented the genre. And this is Blade Runner 2049. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this week's Transatlantic Rebels podcast. Uh, first and foremost, I just want to apologise for being away for a few weeks. Basically, there was uh, a death in my family. It was my grandfather. He was one of my heroes, so uh, it, I had to just take a bit of time out, spend some time with the family and stuff after that. But uh, yeah, I just want to say rest in peace to him, and this episode is dedicated to him. And what an episode we have. This is all about Blade Runner 2049 which Rashad and I have both seen. It was just released a few days ago, and hopefully we're trying to get this out quick fire so it's as relevant as possible. We'll also be referring back to Blade Runner itself. And if I can just start off, what I'll do is a, a, just a few spoiler-free sentences on, on the two films themselves, but mostly we'll be bef- definitely focusing on the new one, uh, 2049. So the original Blade Runner is a 1982 neo-noir science fiction film uh, which faced initial well, initially lukewarm reaction around the world. It didn't really meet its box office targets at all, didn't do too well. Uh, Critics were quite sort of 50-50 about it. However, it quickly evolved into a cult classic at the pinnacle of sci-fi lore. Based on the Philip K. Dick book, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? It was directed by Ridley Scott, starring Harrison Ford, Rutger Hauer, uh, Sean Young and Daryl Hannah. It's a complex film with countless themes, uh, an unconventional narrative, and I mean, both films, they ask a lot more questions than give answers, basically, and that tends to give to repeat viewing for the original. I'm sure the new one's going to be like that as well. So the second film, which was just released a few days ago, and the year is 2017, if you're listening in 2049, this is an incredible sequel. Um, I would argue it's kind of a detachment from where Hollywood meets normal people. I'll get into that later. Um, This is not really... It's advertised as a gigantic blockbuster. This is practically an art house film, and as such, it will lose many, many mainstream viewers. But at times, it feels like endurance almost, because the (laughs) the runtime is 163 minutes, whereas the original was 119 minutes. Um, There is a sensory overload here, but once you get through it, you'll just not stop thinking about it. As a result, this this has been called by critics perhaps one of the best sequels ever. Um, so, it, I mean, it, it's based in the same universe, but it's kind of a, like, what is it, 35 years on or whatever it is. And a lot has happened in those times, which they cover nicely. Um, it's such a long film. We are going to dedicate this episode to 2049. Um but we'll, we will be referring back to the original. So that's the kind of spoiler-free section. So from here on in, we're going to assume that you've actually watched both films. So we're going to go into deep spoilers on it. Right. After all that, Rashad, uh, what are your memories of the original Blade Runner? I really didn't list, watch it when I was a kid. I mean, I had ideals about it. I remember I used to come on like ABC network, a uh, television channel. Um, I just remember it being weird when I was a kid because around the same time, like Star Wars is out. So as a kid, you're more focused on like the Star Wars kind of stuff. But then you kind of see like Harrison Ford and you're like, okay, it's Harrison Ford. Um, and this new sci-fi movie, but this, it's not as fast paced as, um, as Star Wars. But I always remember it catching my mind, so I really didn't pay attention to it until like, like maybe like years ago, like in my twenties when I was in film school and everything like that. So um, my first memories pretty much was like it, it was like it, it caught my attention, 
but it wasn't one of those movies when I was a kid that I watched over and over again. I maybe saw it maybe like three or four times total, and not and not even all the way through. I think at some point I just like drifted off and started doing other stuff. But um, it was around a time when I was like in my twenties that I started picking up on it, and then like just maybe like fifteen years ago, really starting to dive into it. So that's my memories of uh, Blade Runner. It was almost like more like I understood it was an, it was something interesting, but I didn't wrap my head around it until at least in my twenties, and then even more so with the years going by. That's almost identical to me as well. Because don't forget, I mean, we were pretty young when it was released. Um, I was like three or two or something like that. Um, yeah, I think I, I first saw it probably when I was about 17 or 18. It didn't make that much of an impression on me. Um, and then, uh, yeah, as you said, throughout my 20s, I, I watched it a couple of times. I hadn't actually watched it for quite a while, probably about five or six years. So what I did this time around is I went and watched 2049 last night. And today I watched the original Blade Runner, which I hadn't watched for quite a few time, a long time to be honest. So it was still, it was beautifully fresh, both of them. And I thought it was quite interesting watching those two in tandem, but in reverse order. So um, yeah, it really brought out the differences between the two. And there are a lot of differences. Um, so, okay, let, let's get straight to 2049 now. What did you think of it? What's your initial impressions of it? I was like super impressed. I felt like, okay, because be, we, I know you didn't see Mother, but I'm not going to spoil that one. But I, I, I kind of felt the same way about this one that I felt about Mother. And I am gonna, and I guess later on in the discussion, I'll talk about this and like critical reception and the mainstream and all that stuff like that. But I just remember, because I, I watched Mother and Mother had like a similar pace. Arguably, Mother could be, even be arguably to be even slower until like the last like, like 30 minutes of it. Mother wasn't as long. Maybe it was like two and a half hours or something like that. Maybe under that. Something like that. So coming off a of mother a couple weeks ago, I walked this one. The pacing didn't bother me. I know it bothered a lot of people. And I talked to a bunch of people on the internet, especially Twitter, about this. Like matter of fact, I talked to some people today about it. And a lot of people had a hard time with the um the pacing. And I was trying to explain to him, like sometimes because I think in our modern times, like the way movies are edited now, at least especially for the mainstream, it's always get to the point. And it's not saying that's a bad thing. But they, 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 they tend to edit things within into their life just to keep the, the, the pot going, keep it moving because people just want to get to the point because we live in like this, this time where we're always on to the next thing. You want to always be stimulated, always be stimulated. And the thing that I thought about this one is like the main strength of both slave runners and the appreciation of whether you're on board or not because we'll talk about the, like people's perceptions later on. But it's almost like the reason why it feels long is because part of the experience is, is you're living you're spending time with the character and isolation and the confusion stuff like that. So you kind of have to spend these lingering moments where you're just like sitting with that, with the character, whether it's Deckard or whether it's K. K is the main attack, uh, main character of uh, 2049 and Deckard is the main character of the original Blade Runner. And a lot of the time they're by themselves trying to figure things out and just languishing. And it's a lot of slow shots. And like, that's how it feels to be a detective. It's like that thing where it's like, everything's not going to be exciting. It's a lot of waiting around. It's a lot of just waiting for that next information to come by. Um, so the pacing didn't bother me, especially since I watched the last, the original, the, the, um, Blade Runner, the original Blade Runner, maybe a couple nights before I saw it. So the pacing didn't bother me at all. But to me, I was highly impressed. It, it, it for like a couple of days ago, um, Mother's still my number one movie this year. But then as I kept thinking more about Blade Runner up and up, it shot up to my number two. So. That's how impressed I was by the movie. It's, but I will make a I will make a point to the people listening to this. Some of you may like it, some of you may not, and it's one of the things that's okay because I think that's the same way the original was. Yeah, I'm one of those people, or at least if you'd asked me 24 hours ago, I was. Um, my initial feelings when I left the cinema were pretty lukewarm, to be honest. Um, and that's not due to the film being poor or anything like that. It, it was clearly an exceptional film in like eight out of 10 categories. It's just those other two categories. I think it it felt really indulgent. And let me put it this way. The cinema was about maybe 30% full um, and six people walked out, literally walked out after about an hour and a half. But they, they walked out before Harrison Ford came and I looked at my watch and he came in at about one hour 15. No, but yeah, about one hour 50 around that kind of mark. So people literally just left. And you know what? I couldn't even blame them too. That wasn't that it wasn't like Dunkirk for me, which I've, we've covered before, which I, I just, I lost the plot with Dunkirk, but this 
felt really indulgent. And um, 163 minutes, you've got to justify it. I, I think this this almost feels like it was made for Blade Runner fans and also people who are going to just buy this and watch it at home as well with the in the luxury of, you know, watching it in your pyjamas or whatever and you've got the whole day. Whereas I think for the cinema, I'm not... <sighs> I'm not sure that the pacing worked. Everything else worked. The sound was incredible. The the oh my god, the the cinematography was unbelievable. And watching it on a big screen definitely helped with that as well. That was it was like a sensory overload like I said before. Um and, and so many things worked, but I just think there were two things that didn't work for me which was it was too long. I mean saying it's too long it sounds just a bit too you know a bit sort of dumb or whatever but I just think there's some of the transitions that just dragged it definitely dragged and I also think that the absence of a bad guy because um I think Rutger Hauer in the first one was so good I just love him in that even when I was watching it today I was just like I was still on the the edge of my seat that last sort of 20 minutes he's just so good he was brilliant in the 80s full stop and in this one I get the creative decisions they made regarding the two kind of quote-unquote baddies but I'm just not it felt more like a setup for future films as opposed to anything else and I don't know I it was fine. I was okay with it, but it didn't wow me, basically. If you'd had, like, a really amazing villain, that would have pushed it over the edge for me. I would have been like, yeah, forget the pacing. That would have been, like, wow. So, um, I mean, what do you think about that? I disagree with that because I feel like the whole movie was from the perspective of uh, Booker Howard's poem at the end of the first movie. I think pretty much everything, whether, unlike, it, it's a difference between, like, because if you go back to the original movie when you talk about weather, and I was... And like, didn't even allude to explain as much stuff, but he kind of threw like the snow was very important to the um to the thing. And and every every time I seen the snow, it threw me back to the rain situation where it was like there was more rain and that kind of thing. And I felt like to to have a quote unquote villain was beyond the point because because I because I feel like the the main antagonist was kind of like when 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 Jared Little character comes in, it's like how human beings disavow disavow these creatures and they don't see their worth and a point where um, where um, Jared Leto kind of like comes. I, I set the scene up. So there's a situation where um, we're doing all spoilers, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So there's a point where you find out in the movie that these replicants, which are like 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 human created kind of kind of uh, people, that they they discovered that a replicant was able to re- reproduce, which they weren't able to before. So um, Jared Leto wanted to get a hold of that quote unquote technology for his own purposes. And if you watch the scene where he pretty much comes in. And there's another another replicant being just born, and he brings in his his second in command, which is another replicant, which is basically like his 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 uh his his muscle, and he pretty much shows that that person that the um I can't even think of her name, but I was call her the uh the the muscle replicant just for the argument's sake. So I her, call her, her name is her name is Love. Love. Okay. So Love. So basically, he goes in a room and he talks to the the, the newly born replicant. And he cuts the new replicant, which is a female, at the gut, which is pretty much like where your, where your child would be. And the whole time you're watching, you watch, you're seeing if you most of the time when you, he's talking, but some of the time talking, it's, it's focused on her face. And it's kind of like that look where it's like you're less than anything. And like she spends the whole movie, it, the revelation comes out. She's not hunting down the main character, Ryan Gosling K, because it's her duty. She's trying to prove her worth. Like she, she deserves to be there. It's like, Jared Leto kind of seen her as a lesser. Those two, the replicants that can't reproduce, they're lesser than what they are. As, and then she's going through the whole movie trying to prove herself like, look, I'm more than this. I can be more than that. So the the real villains, humanity, humanity just pretty much like left them aside. Like they're just nothing but tools and nothing. And you go back to the beginning of the movie where you have, um, you have Dave Bautista. He's another replicant. And he was like, your mind will change when you see a miracle. Like there's so much stuff to unpack. It's, we're not going to be able to unpack it all of it in this thing. I feel like this is one of the movies where it's, it's going to be like the original Blade Runner. Like, everybody's going to have their instant reactions and I and I really believe that it's going to be this, I feel like it's going to be the same thing like Mother. It's going to be the thing where everybody's going to have their reactions and then months down the road when everything settles and then the hype wears down and then all this box office discussion, which we'll get to later on, goes away and you actually sit with it. Because I don't believe that the same thing, I think the same thing's going to happen with this movie with Blade Runner where it's like, a lot of people say it's slow. When I watched Blade Runner for the first time in my 20s, I was like, this movie's slow as fuck, and that movie was even lesser than this. So, I, so, 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 like I said, I, so I guess because I guess because you, and, and I'm, I'm, judging, I'm not judging your opinion, and you have every right to think what you're saying, but I felt like watching Mother 
and then watching the original Blade Runner again before seeing this one, I the the um the pacing that bothered me because I went to see Mother twice. And going back to saying when people were leaving at the movie theater, like people left the movie theater on Mother. People left Mother on like the half hour in. And then there was a, a two people where it was like the movie had 15 minutes left and something happened on that screen and they were out of there. And I think what's I think what's happening right now a little bit when it comes to timing, and it goes back to how we see time in this day and age, where everything is fast. Like somebody will have an album come out, and only it only came out three months ago, but then in your mind, he's like, that's a long ass time that album been out. Like I remember when Kendrick Lamar's album came out, and, I, and some people were thinking like, okay, that in people's minds, I'm looking on Twitter and stuff like that. In people's minds, they feel like that album came out maybe like a year ago. You know what I'm trying to say? So th- I think there's some of that in there, but I'm not going to argue because I was talking to the, I was talking to another person on Twitter about the time thing. Like I will never argue the time thing with anybody because if you feel like it's too long, then it's too long. That's not for me to debate with you. But I can only go by my experience and what I walked into in a movie theater. Like I was not bored at all, and it was funny because because when I went to the movie, because I usually go when I see arty movies or movies that um, that's going to take my time to focus. I usually don't go with people. And my friend came in with his with his, with his girlfriend, and he's like, "You're here," and he's shocked to see me there. And usually, he's a guy that kind of like, like, okay, get to the point. And then he surprised me, so he so he so he texted me, and he's like, "So, sure, what do you think about the movie?" And I was like, "I really liked it." And then he texted me back. He was like, "I liked it too." He was like, "I don't understand." And like, he's a guy, like he's a get to the point guy. And even he was like, he was like, "I don't get why people say it was too long." He was like, "It, it was perfectly placed for me." And I agree with the same way with them too. But then when I debate with somebody today today about it, I was like, I won't argue that. But I also feel like at some point later on that um that that I think it might lessen for it might lessen at a home base than anything else if you're in the movie theater you're sitting in that seat like or whatever like that. But going back to I'm I'm wrap this up because I'm talking too long. But um but for me, I've since my twenties and growing like going to stuff like that. Like the pacing, if, if 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 your character's engrossing and the world's engrossing, then I can kind of like deal with that. But I wouldn't argue anybody else's point of view on that. Okay, so basically, there are, there are two points I want to make. So last night I felt quite lukewarm about it because of the pacing. However, today I've been thinking about the film constantly, and and also I watched the original Blade Runner. So today's literally just been all Blade Runner day. Well, the last twenty six hours or whatever. So I really found enjoy. I, I found huge enjoyment in dissecting. Um, the new Blade Runner, reading about it, thinking about it, you know, stumbling across various articles and this and that, and then ultimately recording this podcast. Because I think it was one, this is what I mean. It's one of these ones that I kind of endured it a little bit, not in the same way as I've endured other films this year, um, but, but I endured it in the cinema more than I enjoyed it to an extent. But I know once I get this film home in six months time, I will love it. And pick, but that's because I'll be sitting around. And then if a, if a part comes where I think, okay, yeah, this bit drags a little bit, or he's just, you know, making coffee or whatever, then I can just go off, grab a bowl of cereal, come back and I haven't missed anything. I don't have to pause the film or whatever. It's like that. It's like a whole morning's entertainment. Yeah. Whereas I think in the cinema, it, I still think it dragged, if I'm honest. I just don't think there was enough plot to to justify that length. Um, and and it's not even like a... I don't even think it's like a get-to-the-point thing. I think it's just literally like... I get what you're saying about the downtime of detectives and waiting around and stuff like that, but I don't, I don't even think that's relevant. I just think it was a bit indulgent, to be honest. I, I, it just... Even just knock 10 minutes off it, and it would have psychologically felt a bit different i think the difference is if you if you take something like interstellar or inception inception's like three hours long or avatar is three and a half days long whatever but they don't feel like it because there's always something happening and not in like a a dopamine hit way but but it feels justified that there are things constantly happening or it's well paced with this i think it was just a little bit too kind of and, and, and I get that there's, okay, there's this blackouts happen, there's been some sort of nuclear disaster or whatever, or ecological disaster and stuff. And it's a very different feel to the original one. The original one is basically like, it's like Tokyo. When I went to Tokyo, I went to Tokyo probably, no, yeah, it was probably 25 years after the original one. So it was quite a long time. It still had that feel, you know, albeit updated. You've got neon lights, you've got, you know, huge flashing displays of advertising and this and that. I think the new one... But but the old one is very grounded in reality because those they didn't have CGI back then in that kind of respect. The new one's very CGI and it's a hugely different feel. Plus, it's a lot more downtrodden. Everyone's a bit more depressed, a bit more. You know, even Kay himself is. It's it's a real different feel to to what Deckard was like. 
Um, I think they both work equally in their time. The first one is super 80s. It's like one of the most 80s films. Take that and Scarface, you've basically got the DNA of the 80s. Whereas I think this one is very du jour. Um, Denis Villeneuve is amazing. He's on, on this incredible run. And I think he continues it with this. I could just have done with 10 minutes less or maybe even 15. Um, j- just trim the fat a bit. But uh, I, I get what you're saying. And um, But... I think the proof is in the pudding. And this is the other thing I'd say. Critics are raving about it. Like, you know, it's, it's got 87%, 90% Rotten Tomatoes. Critics are generally just basking in the glory of it. Real people on Twitter, I was reading reviews. A lot of them were like, oh my God, it was so long. Oh my God, it was, it was good. It was so long. I don't get the hype, blah, blah, blah. And these are people who aren't Blade Runner obsessives. I mean, you and I probably aren't Blade Runner obsessives, but we happen to have seen the first one a few times, like it, know the genre, all that kind of stuff. So... I think I think that's where I was talking about this disconnect between what real normal people are going to see. You know, they, they've, they're watching Friday night television. They see a nice interview with Harrison Ford and Ryan Gosling. It's funny. They think, OK, you know, this Saturday night, should we go see Blade Runner? Yeah. OK, love. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. Let's get a babysitter. I would not take my wife to see this. She, she would have been bored senseless, basically, after about an hour and a half. She would just be squirming in her seat, you know, Um and she's not a thicker or anything like that. You know, she would have understood of it all. But I just think she would have thought, okay, this is a bit long, basically. So I don't know. Um, but saying all that, the length and what I perceived as a slightly weak villain are the only two things that I didn't enjoy. Everything else I loved. You know, I think Ryan Gosling, fantastic performance. Um Harrison Ford comes into it a bit late, like he comes in at the third act, by which time, like I said, it's an hour and 50. But yeah, and I don't think he has a massive part to play, like he has like one or two really crucial scenes. Um, I love the backstory that, that he actually hit Ryan Gosling by accident. That's uh, I don't know if you've seen the still of that. Have you seen the Oh, yeah, I've seen still? it. Oh my God, it's clap. I want to make that like my wallpaper on my phone. Um I also love the cosmopolitan feel of the cast. You've got, obviously, you've got Americans, but you've got Canadians, you've got Dutch, you've got Cubans, you've got Somali, you've got an Israel Palestinian. Um, who else? What's the other one? Yeah, Swiss. Oh, yeah, it's, it's amazing. I love it. I just love it. It's brilliant. And the original was kind of like that as well, but obviously, like, you're talking quite a long time back, so, so a bit less politically sensitive. Um, what were your favourite things from this film? Um, my My most... My favorite thing in this movie, and and it, and, it, and like this is the this is this is my Rosetta Stone to the whole entire movie is the middle scene with the uh, memories where um K comes up and who you want to find out later on is going to be um Deckard's daughter um she starts she's she's in this forest and then she starts um uh, unpacking like starting to design a new kind of memory with the with the children and to me I felt like that was. And like I said, this is going to be a long time for unpacking. And this is when I, I watch it like three or four times and I'll get it. But to me, I feel like my gut is telling me like, like how Rucker Howard's speech about, um, uh, the Rucker, Rucker Howard speech at the end of Blade Runner defined that movie's theme, overall theme. It's going to be that middle one, that speech that she gives to Kay. That one defines her overall aspect of, um, of Blade Runner 2049. Because even if you're going back to where you see at the end of the movie where uh, he's in the snow and then you kind of see her making snow. So then that opens up the whole entire movie of how much of his perception is off. His memories are already off and being designed by somebody else. How much of that movie's perception is off? Are you actually seeing what you're supposed to be seeing or is it just things that she's making him see? And that opens up the whole entire thing, which is, which goes beyond like that. Because I have to push back sometimes as a writer because sometimes I know people say you need – Villains, like I said, I'm not talking about your point of view, but for for me personally, there's 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 three types of story. There's man versus man, there's man versus self, there's man versus nature, and there's man versus what's the other one? I'm screwing up. I'm having brain fart today. And like to me, like I felt like because of the fact that it's about memories, like the the antagonist of the movie was perception and what and what it, and what it, what it means to be human. The same way with him, and the same way with her. Like Jared Leto's whole entire thing wasn't was just there to motivate her to try to prove that she's real it's like pinocchio to the fifth power so for me basically my the whole entire movie turns on his head because when you see him laying on that the the ground when he's laying on those steps and he's looking up at the sky so you have to ask yourself is he really seeing that snow or is that something she's just allowing him to see and it's not really there so it gets weird at some points 
and the whole entire thing with sex and all that other stuff. And it goes, back. well, it doesn't much more things, but that's like probably my favorite thing in a movie. And it colors my whole view of it to a certain extent. So my, my favorite scene is the end of the scene that you just described. Um, because that is the point where he realizes that it's, it, it wasn't his memory that she, it was created. Right. And is that the point where he absolutely loses it and like starts smashing the chair around and stuff like that? Was it at that point where Kay does that? I think he, I think my memory going back, I think if it's not there, then it's a little bit after that. If, if it's not at that point, then it's a little bit after that. I think it might be at that point. I think it was. I think it was basically, so so he's interacting with, um, what's her name? Car- uh, Carla, yeah. No, sorry, that's the actress's name. Uh, with Anna, who who ends up, who lives in that bubble and stuff. The listeners might think we're completely wrong, but so basically they have that interaction. He realizes that, okay, his, his memories have been implanted and then he just completely bursts um, and, and he just starts chucking the chair around and stuff like that. And then I think the police come out. So I, I think so. Whatever it was is when he loses the plot, when Kay finally shows that incredible burst of emotion, because actually he's kind of, he, he, do, he cries as well. It's, it's really funny with replicants and crying. Cause you kind of like, okay, there are so many questions posed, but very few answers. So it's left up to you to imp- interpret what you want to really. Like like you're saying, you can come back to it three or four times and watch it. You still might not get any answers. It might just be your point of view. And I think that's obviously going to be the case with this film. I think that's that's the kind of DNA of Blade Runner and and, and they've continued that in this film. Um, I do like that there were kind of well well-paced twists and stuff like that. Like initially I was like, okay, because I didn't watch any trailers or anything like that. I hate watching trailers now. And it really helped me watching this film. Um, I didn't realize Ryan Gosling was going to be a replicant. Um, so so that was already a nice twist in like first few minutes and stuff. Um, and then I, I like the, I like the sensation when he starts to feel like he is the one, like, you know, like the Neo in the Matrix and, and that the, the Harrison Ford might just be his father and all this kind of stuff. And then the crushing realization that it's, it's not true that it was actually a girl and all this kind of stuff. Um, I, th- I think Dennis Villeneuve toyed with our emotions really well, actually. Um, the what was the other thing? I, there was oh yeah, that sex scene. It's fantastic. The the threesome sex scene. I love Joy's character as well. I love the names as well. Joy uh, Joy is obviously like this kind of like artificial artificial intelligence hologram esque type thing, and um, and then love. Love is the character who's like the like you said the the, the replicant muscle to uh, to Wallace, and she's just in search of love from Wallace. She's always in search of approval and all this kind of stuff. Even as she's killing um, Lieutenant Joshi, she's crying and all this kind of stuff. I think there's so many nice little touches everywhere, all over the place. It's kind of like this is what I mean about sensory overload. Uh, when I came out of the film, I was like, I, I just wish it moved a bit quicker. But then I guess if it had moved quicker, I wouldn't have had time to digest everything. So maybe I'm just wrong. Um, okay. So how do you think it related in terms of the, the way that they couched it to the original Blade Runner? That it's kind of like, what, how many years? Like 40, no, 30 years onwards, right? And um, so at the end of the, the original Blade Runner, um that that the head honcho bloke is dead, and the Ty no Tyrell yeah Mr Tyrell he's dead. So this guy has come along, and um, Jared Leto's character who's uh, I was going to call him Christopher Wallace, but it's actually Neander Wallace, and uh, he's created the the funny thing about this is that yeah he's the bad guy, but he's actually done loads of good, and even if you're looking at him thinking oh he's bad you could argue that's a point of view because he's trying to save humanity again, right? There's obviously been some sort of huge event. So, so how do you think it related to, um, to the original plot of, of Blade Runner? A a lot of it is just like, it's it's a compliment. It's not exactly pushing the story forward because the, the whole, I think the whole thing with, with Decker is, is just like the, like, like, just like the, I'm sure see the, the point of plot is not the whole Decker who's Decker's kid. The whole like if if the point of the first one is what is it to be human? I feel like this one is 
it's that, but it's also what are your memories? Like, what do memories mean to somebody? Like, in, in the sense like that. I think I think the theme of this one is memory. I haven't got a 100% grasp on it, but I feel like that's the bigger one. I think the fact that they got the fact of, of, of K being a replicant at the beginning, not even 10 minutes into the movie to get out the way, because Vin Du's not interested. Like, okay, is he really a replicant or not? He's not interested in that. That was the whole thing with we'll ar- debate and argue with um with um with Decker. Even in this movie, they kind of play on that a little bit. Like, okay, the guy the, uh, he throws at him, like, well, you could have been programmed to kind of blah 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 blah. And he doesn't really yeah. know, so they even throw that. So they don't they don't even answer that if Decker's a replicant or not. But they're not interested in that, so they don't go. He Villeneuve's not interested in repeating that. Oh, who's really a replicant or not? So okay, so that one. So you complement the original theme of what is it to be human. And then you compound the thing of if you if 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 you're thinking about humanity, you think about consciousness. So then you can go into the fact of the matter of like what makes a human a human, and then it's is it is it the sum of everything that you understand who you are? Because you because half the movie once K thinks that he's this, that he thinks he's the kid of Deckard, then he feels like he gets a sense of purpose. Going back to what I'm saying about with the with with the quote unquote bad guy in love trying to prove herself, like yeah, I am. I am the best. I am blah, blah, blah. I'm more than what they tell me I am. So it's like these people trying to, so he tries to prove himself. And it's almost like, it's almost like when you're a kid and it's like, you could be anything you want to be. And then you think you are that. And you get onto the world and you, you try to achieve that goal. And then the world tells you, no, you're not that. And then you kind of like, and then you, and then you keep kind of like trudging along. It's like, it's almost like, it's almost like once you find out that the world and your life wasn't what you think it is. You kind of go through that daily grind until you find another way to find some kind of purpose. And I felt like that's what happened in the middle of the movie. Once he found out that that what the, the memory thing, it wasn't who he, that she put those things in there, and he has to point it. He's kind of like just doing it just to find some kind of purpose because he lost his purpose again. And then he and then he kind of reignites it in a way where it's like, okay, my purpose wasn't to be his kid or to be the chosen one. I guess my purpose ultimately was to help this guy and his and his daughter reconnect. But then you ask a bigger question because was he manipulated into doing that? You know what I'm trying to say? Because you look at the end of the movie and you see her like you see her with the snow. So and a bigger question is like was it of his own accord to even make the choice to do that, or was this human beings once again just manipulating these things to do what they want to do to get to the point where they gotta go? Which is interesting because if she's half human, half replicant. That makes it even more interesting, and that opens up a whole bunch of new questions. Yeah, and I, I think that the sort of central theme of this is obviously kind of like she's a replicant. Well, well as in like her mother is a replicant. So it, you'd think, yes, this is impossible. This is a miracle. Did it really happen as well? All this kind of stuff. And then is Decker a replicant? That's the original thesis. We know that obviously um, Ryan Gosling is. Again, it's kind of like, you're absolutely right. It's not really the point of it. And if you're talking about memories and all these kind of things, what distinguishes the replicants from the humans in the end? It's it's class, really. It's it's a power structure. Um, because, okay, they might be new, they might be created, but we're created as well. We're just created by our parents. And if you, if you sort of, put it this way, if Ryan Gosling's character was black and all the replicants were black, then you'd have a very different Blade Runner and it would be very obvious that there's this huge kind of slavery thing going on. It would be, it would kind of be overwhelming, wouldn't it? But it would be, it would certainly make it a lot more instant to a lot more people. Um, because even like when, one of the first scenes where he's kind of, he's going, I think he's going back to his flat after work and, uh, he's going down the street and he has to be quite deferential to people. Kind of people are looking at him, you know, and then he goes, gets back to his flat. And I think someone's written like fuck off skin job or whatever, or, or something, something like that on him. So this is not an easy life for him. He's a second class citizen, if that, and, and even like love, um, you know, she's constantly striving for affection. All of the replicants are, and it, there are so many layers to this and there were layers to the original one, but I, I think in a, in a lot more different layers, to be honest. Like the original one, you've got Daryl Hannah and Rutger Hauer. They were the kind of main, and the and the other dude. The, those are the kind of main replicants. They were Nexus Six models who had just gone rogue. This is not about going rogue. The, these guys know their place, um, but they're trying to identify with it. And also the fact that they were probably like quote unquote born two years ago, and and they are fully formed adults. So 
it's it's like a real head spin to be honest and yeah it, this is why this is why i just love thinking about it today I've, i found more pleasure thinking about it today than i did watching it um which is a strange one apart from like the sort of visuals of it i loved the visuals whilst i was watching it i also think the score was really good um so should we move on to the visuals and the score actually so what mm-hmm. so the um the cinematographer is this guy what's his name roger deakins roger deakins that's it and his CV is just ridiculous. I mean, and the, the, the funny thing is he's never won an Oscar either. So, um, I mean, frankly, if he can't win an Oscar for this, he's just like not even submit his films there anymore. <laughs> it's just... It, it, this is why one, I don't care about Oscars. Of, uh, mm. Yeah, I mean, this this is like Nas never won a Grammy kind of thing. Um, so, I, I I mean, what did you think of the visuals? I'm rambling a bit. So no, I, I've, I, just, I've kind of stuck I, I just, in this infinite loop. I just, I just feel like, and I was, and I was watching the, um, I was watching the Blu-ray the other day about the making of, uh, there was no Blade Runner. It's like a three hour and a, and, and a half long, like documentary on the making of, um, of Blade Runner. And, and really Scott said something interesting. He was like, he was like, being ahead of, being ahead of your time is just as frustrating as being behind the times. Because if you're ahead of your time, then the technology that you're, that, that you're, that you're in right now is, isn't catching up to what you really wanted, wanted to do. So I feel like, it's like George Lucas said about episode one of Phantom Menace. And, and this is what some people, some people don't understand sometimes, especially with visionaries who have to deal with tactile things and deal with things like the logistics of like dealing with a corporation and then dealing with the people that work with you. And there's so many other out, outside influences that you have to manipulate to get what's in your head to get out on screen. That's a miracle that you even get close to like, 25% of what you want because you're orchestrating all the stuff right there. So keeping that in mind, I feel like, and I know people shit on CGI. I mean, I think, I think people shit on CGI when it's not implemented correctly, but it's, it's, it's another tool just like practical effects. But I, for me, I feel like going to visuals and cinematography, I feel like that technology finally caught up to what Blade Runner was trying to go for i feel like but a different way because dilly villeneuve's direction director style and vision is different from um ridley scott's but i feel like when i watch the original blade runner and and, and, and sometimes i get mad at film film like film heads and film twitter sometimes like that and sometimes nostalgia kind of gets in people's minds sometimes and they don't see the force of trees if i watch the, if you watch the original blade runner as great as the vision is in 2017, if you're really, if you're really, if you really be a mercenary about it, you can see where there's matte paintings, and you can see the composite shots that are pretty obvious, stuff like that. Even though the vision is still intact, you kind of have to go into it, watching it, and going, okay, I know these things are what they are, but I'm willing to, I'm, but the vision is so great, I'm willing to like suspend my disbelief that I'm not really seeing a matte painting or something like that. So when I watch this movie, I feel like that it blended in just right. I think everything blended in, right. The, the the color schemes where it's like it's it's like orange, like on on Las Vegas, and it's like 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 bleak white when he meets um uh um Dave Bautista's character, and it's just like even th- when he goes to the city, the, the the classic Blade Runner city, it's like even that is like more realized because you're not seeing the matte paintings anymore. It's like the digital and the practical effects are so blended in. Like I got so much more lost in that, and I think the thing that helped it is because. If you see the grading in the original um, Blade Runner, it's like you can't help but to deal with that 70s like like texturing. Whereas when you see the texturing in this Blade Runner 2049, it's crisp, but it's crisp in a rich way. Like the visuals just pop and stuff like that. So I think that this is the realization of what Blade Runner was was what he was going for because if you make the argument he didn't really get the chance to make the film that he wanted to make because it went through so many iterations before he got to the final cut and even a final cut is not where he wants it to be because if you watch the documentary he's like even the final cut is close to where he wants it to be but it's still not even close to where he wanted it to be so for me I just thought it was outstanding for me the visuals yeah and there are a couple of points like you mentioned George Lucas um I mean, people have a go at George Lucas for coming back and touching up bits of Star Wars. But, I mean, he's got every right to do that because if you've got that original vision but you couldn't implement it at the time, then I I don't see anything majorly wrong as long as you're not, like, taking a machete to it. And and Ridley Scott has said, look, I'm of the same mind. I agree with George Lucas. You know, I should be able to do this, you know. So, I mean, the the version that I've watched more than any is is the final cut version. So I I barely remember the first one, to be honest, in terms of the differences. Um. 
Okay, let, let's get to the sound. Um, so Hans Zimmer did the score. Uh, what did you What did you think of the score? Because there was quite a few kind of other people. So LP, the rapper and producer, um, he originally did some stuff, but it was rejected, stroke ignored. Um, and then there was Johan Johansson, um, who had worked with Dennis Villeneuve before, and uh, and then Hans Zimmer and Benjamin uh, Wolfish. Wolfish, yeah, yeah, they they were ended up they ended up doing it, and it was like this whole big thing. Johansson couldn't comment on stuff and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> I mean, what did you think of the score? I thought it was adequate. It's not as it's not as iconic as the original Blade Runner score because who can come after Vangelis? It's like he just like just got his own thing going on. But it there's, there's a thing with scoring in this modern age where I think they're pulling it back because I think what I think this is just my personal theory. I think what happened was, and this goes back to the nostalgia thing. I think John Williams was such a trendsetter that film scores became the star, and I think in this age. I think they're pulling it back to kind of like put it back in the background where not to say where it belongs, but I think that they don't bring as much attention to the score as they used to in these days. For whatever reason, whatever it is, I think the John Williams era where like you think about John Williams scores and it's like they're all memorable. You had Danny Elfman, you had the Back to the Future theme and a lot of that stuff for film, for film people that are age, that's a part of your childhood. So that stuff kind of sticks with you. Whereas in this age, it's kind of like, okay. These are the stories we tell it. We want the we want the the score to kind of like just serve the purpose and not bring attention to itself. So most of the time I watched the movie, I didn't the, the score didn't bring attention to itself. But there are times here and there where I heard like 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 inflections of Blade Runner. I thought the sound design was way more way more interesting than the uh, the scoring. But the scoring wasn't terrible. It wasn't like bad. But I, I think it was just like just meant to be where it was. And like the 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 sound effects were just the ones that just like really blew me away. See, I loved the score. Well, I loved, I loved all the sound because Hans Zimmer also did Dunkirk, and that thing did my head in. Like, absolutely, it's constant bang, bang, crash, go, and and it's like Jesus Christ. So this, this, I was a bit because I, I think that was one of the few things I knew. Like Hans Zimmer did the score. I was like, shit, man, please don't be like Dunkirk, basically. And and I loved it. I absolutely thought it was fantastic. Um, the music didn't get in the way. It wasn't quite as iconic as that. See, it's funny when I was watching the first one today, the original Blade Runner. I I didn't think, and I was even listening with headphones on because I wanted like a full experience. I didn't think the score was that amazing in terms of compared to certain other over the top 80s films i think it was just brilliant it was really good but it, i i i think um i think last night's one wasn't quite that to that level but it you're right it just kind of i think it meshed more with the story and it kind of undulated with the actual plot points a lot better this time around i think last time it was kind of hacked in a little bit at times um with the original one but it was but it was more kind of iconic um and and the whole thing just has a different feel like you know you've got like an over the top quote unquote bad guy in Rutger Hauer you've got kind of no CGI so it felt really kind of like more, much more tangible than this one um, so uh, uh, even like even like imagine this basically if if 2019 was you know like 35 years away this wasn't supposed to be like oh this is a realistic view, future vision of that what we think that's going to be we think okay the world's gone a bit crazy and then there's these whole replicant things and blah 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 and then this film, the new one, is that, okay, straight after that, the shit hit the fan. There was some sort of, you know, the blackout or whatever it's called. And, and people are still dealing with the ramifications of that. So, so everything has sort of tied in nicely. You know, the cinematography is a bit more drab. It's certainly not as spangly. And, and the, the score is a bit more subdued. And I think everything, all the decision making, or well, almost all the decision making, I think was brilliant. Um, I, I just think, I think Villeneuve's in, in this groove, like, Originally, they wanted Christopher Nolan, and I can imagine that Christopher Nolan might have done a good job with this, but then he also might have just gone full Chris Nolan, and yeah. and, and and that's the risk. Whereas I think Villeneuve right now, it, he he's a genial director who has very little ego about him by the looks of it. I think that's the difference. Yeah, um, I mean, maybe in five years' time he might have developed that ego. I don't know, but but he's certainly at a good moment right now, and he should keep it going as long as possible because he's, he's getting to legendary status give him five years and like shit man i mean who he's knows? a more subtle director he's a lot like uh, we his last major film was arrival and we've yes. done a podcast just about arrival for me 
I mean, I, I instantly preferred Arrival to this film. Like after I left, I was thinking, I was like, yeah, you know, it was so good, but it just dragged and compare that to Arrival and Arrival just really hit me. But I think that that's just a personal thing. If there'd been an Arrival 35 years ago made by Ridley Scott and this was the sequel, then I might have a completely different notion. Do you know what I mean? So um, you, you can only kind of take it on its own terms, to be honest. Um the other thing I wanted to mention, this is just a completely ran- random segue. I I, um, I received a, a Samsung Gear VR virtual reality headset today, the uh, the the version with the controller. And the f- I, I tried it out today. The first thing that that came up on on the App Store within that thing was this new Blade Runner thing. So Blade Runner twenty forty nine, and it's in conjunction with Oculus Rift. And um, so, so I actually did it. It's free. You can just do it. It's amazing. If there are any listeners, there's probably like two listeners out there who, who could be able to do this. But it's just so cool. Um, you might feel a little, little bit woozy, but it's just incredible. You get basically you get into this flying space that flying police car thing or whatever, and then you're just driven around and you have like a couple of ejectors to do and stuff. It's just so cool. And you can literally, you literally, I'm looking around as if there's not a microphone. There's literally, you're looking around your room, yeah. And you could just see like 360. It's super cool. So if anyone has access to that, if you do have a VR headset, just go do that. It's so, so cool. It's really ironic that that was like the first thing on the store. Um, all right, getting back to 2049. Now, um, was there anything you didn't like? Honestly, like, if, if- I can't really. Do, I, I, okay, let me qualify this. Like, if I watch a film, and I, and I qualify this for myself, if I watch a film and I really enjoy it to love it, and like, there's not. In a movie like this that I love, like, there's not really that. There's not any. I'm struggling to find nitpicks. Let, let me qualify. I don't believe in perfect films. I, just, I, I only have a pet peeve I put on, on, on Facebook. I'm on Twitter where people say, well, it's not perfect, but I'm like, no shit, nothing's perfect. I'm like, but if 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 uh, if if a movie is so enjoyable that, and this is one, of the, and this is and this is and this was number, this is my fourth favorite movie of the year when I first saw it. And it came out to the theater, and then a couple of days later it jumped up to two, so that says a lot. Mother is still like, for me, is like just like has, it, that's going to be a different story. But pe- I know people, ninety five percent of people are going to hate Mother, so I don't even bother with that. But, um. I'll sit, I'm trying. I'm, I'm I'm struggling to find something that I hate. It. I don't hate anything. I think if I'm no, struggling, I, I, sit, I, I, I don't. I don't want to kind of press you into hate. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to. But like, if there was anything you thought could have been, say, say if there was something you thought could have just was a little bit unfulfilled or could have been maximized a bit more or, or taken out a bit more or whatever. Like, it doesn't have you know. If I'm being honest, saying that, that it's not perfect, and I'm pretty sure if I look at it really hard, I could find nothing. I don't think. I have any real, like, real complaints. I really don't. I was like, I was, I watched the whole thing through and, like, I didn't flirt in my seat. If anything, like, I held it, I held my, I held my pee until it got to the end of the movie. I had to pee friggin', like, an hour in and I was like, <laughs> I could deal with this shit. I, I refused to leave this theater. I didn't want to miss one moment. Like, I was just engrossed in it. And it's, and it's interesting. And there's a point I'm going to make at the end of this because I've read something that the, the writer said. There's a certain, there's a certain thing out there right now that influenced it. And I'm and I'm like they got it like they got what he was trying to do but I'll get to that at the end when we do final remarks but I just I just to me it's going to sound like sacrilege but to me I I enjoyed this movie in one sitting more than I enjoyed watching the old Blade Runner that's just for me though but I can see other people going the other way like I love but but, but but that's not sacrilege at all I mean if, if for some people it's like, going to be if you look on Twitter there's some people that think that's sacrilege. There's going to, if I said to certain people, they're going to come at me at my neck. Trust me. Hmm. Matter, matter of fact, there's a poet. I'm sorry. There's a, there's a poet named Paulo Coelho. Uh, I'm sure you might know him. Paulo Coelho. I can't get his name right. And he's a, oh, Paulo, he's a, Paulo Coelho. Yeah. Yeah. And he didn't even see the movie. This is, this, this, this is how, this is how the cult of Blade Runner is. He was like, he was like, I'm glad. He's like, I'm glad it flopped because you never trust it. You should never touch the classics. And I'm like, come on, bro. You all people should know better. And that's how some people can get with Blade Runner. Some people don't. Some people will not see it on the principle that it should never be a sequel. Oh my God, Paolo Coelho said that. <laughs> yes, yes. Man, he wrote The Alchemist. How are you gonna? Oh, God, how are you gonna do, that, man? do you know what? Do you know how many fucking sequels he's written to The Alchemist? That is irony. That is fucking irony, man. Jesus. All right, look. The, the, there's one point I want to make before we get to the next section. So, mm-hmm. you know how you t- you keep talking about Mother. So, who directed that? Darren Aronofsky. 
Yeah, so basically, I listened to a podcast. It was, um, I think it was Tim Ferriss, actually. No, it was either Tim Ferriss or Lewis Howe. It was one of the two. And um, and they, they interviewed Darren Aronofsky. And it was really good, actually. That like, was a good kind of hour and a half chat or something. You got to send it to me. Yeah, I definitely will. You'd enjoy it. And um, And one of the points he makes is that basically he's jealous of musicians because like a musician could just write a song in like 10 minutes and then it can get fast tracked from you know from their thoughts to getting released within like a few months in theory you know or even sooner sometimes if you're jay-z um he said that when he did his films it's literally like at least like a sort of three to five year process of trying to bang out the script then revise it revise it revise it again and then actually trying to get funding because he the way that they do it is he tries to it's kind of almost like a plc effectively he tries to raise the funding himself and then it's actually getting it down and getting the right cast and filming it properly and then editing it which takes him like nine months and stuff and and so he said it's literally it's, it's almost like a miracle if you do get a really truly great film because there are so many factors against it and 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 so if you take that to blade runner well the original or this it just when you were talking before, it really made me think of it, and and well, I st- I still need to watch Mother because we were kind of in a mourning period because my grandfather, so I just haven't been able to see like Mother or it because we were going to do a podcast on it, but I still haven't seen them. Um, it, it's just fascinating that that this Blade Runner has come out so fully formed actually because they only started making it well ugh, making it they started filming it like probably last year I think it was beginning of last year or something so. It just amazes me, like the, the breadth and scope of this is incredible, and, and uh, for them to do such a good job. Because I, I know as time goes on, that my opinion will only increase of this film. Um, I, I still, I still think I've got like you know those couple of minor gripes I have are still valid, but um, but yeah, I, I just think it's 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 just amazing. Plus, you've got like you were alluding to before, you've got these diehard Blade Runner fans who think it can't be touched and stuff, and you can understand it because. You, look two words total recall we love total recall the original it's just so amazing fun film another one sort of based on a dick novel and um and and the the remake they did was just pointless and i think no one wanted a pointless remake to blade runner because that's sacrilege i think that is sacrilege i'm not even like a super fanboy of the original but i even i would know that so i'm glad that they did a really good job um Okay, let's move on to the cast. I think what we should just do is go through some of the cast members and just have brief thoughts of how well you think they did and their characters and stuff like that. So, uh, Ryan Gosling as K. I think he did a solid job. I enjoyed him. It's a a difficult... The the K role is difficult because for the majority of the movie, he's just... He's he's reactionary while being proactive. If that makes sense. You know, until he until he finds his purpose about, wow, maybe I am his son and I can do this stuff. And then that's when he perks up. So I think the main character for the, for, for, for like most of the movie was the world around him and how he kind of like reacted, how, how he kind of like adapted to it and dealt with it. And then once he got his purpose, that's when the story took on another dimension and jumped on that. And then when he found out he wasn't, took on another dimension and jumped that way. So I thought he was he was very solid. I don't think it's like I don't think it's like uh I say the same thing like I say about Harrison Ford in the first one. It's not the the, the greatest thing I've see, seen him do, but Villeneuve used him just to the point where he needed to be used. I believe that's my just my opinion on that kind of situation. I think he got a lot more screen time than Harrison Ford got in the original. To be honest, for, from what I can tell, um, I, I don't have minutes to sort of you know a ratio or anything, but it felt like this. This felt like. At least half of this felt like a Ryan Gosling film, whereas I think the original Blade Runner. What shocked me today, watching it after after a few years, is that it's so fragmented. Like, like um, what's her name? Rachel, um, Sean Young's character, Rachel in it. She's barely in it. I mean, she's barely, barely in it. This like, I mean, it's incredible how little she is, even though she's so iconic from it. So, and whereas in this film, I think. Joy is actually in it a lot. So so that's an actress called uh, Ana de Armas, and I think she's from Cuba. So I've never seen her in anything. She looks really familiar. I'm sure I had, but but I haven't. So um, what did you think of her as Joy? I thought she, to me, I think she was like the MVP of the movie. To me, right there, like that that role and kind of like help. And uh, I think they, whenever they, whenever they work together, like they were fantastic. But I think it's like that thing of, it's just, it's just that weird thing where it's like as sad as, as sad as his life was, like hers was like 
just as sad. You know what I'm trying to say? It's like, and then you see at the end where he's like staring up at the 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 uh the life size version of her naked and nude and kind of like I'm whatever you want me to think you want me to be or what you want me to say. It's like that sad and it's like that art. Like so, you ask a question like, does she really love him? Once she once that he put her in that that machine right there, it's like, and he took her off of like his his um his his apartment and just brought him brought her along with him. It's like. It's like, did she really, that, that's another question, like, did she really love him after he got her off of that, her, 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 her joy 1.0 and she got her 2.0, like, did he, did he really love him, or was, like, this is another part of, like, that program, which, in your brain kind of, like, it, and it sounds simple, like, saying it, but it's not simple, you really have to think about that. And that's and that's the thing, I think, with both preventers, it's just simply simple, because you see the plot, well, it's about people, it's about these things created by man that don't know if they're human or not. Like you can sit there and say that millions of times. Like there's millions of stories like that, but it's in the execution and how you develop the characters. And like to make a hologram like that a three dimensional character, and then at the end we watch the movies like was she really three dimensional at all? You know what I'm saying? It's like hallucinogen. It's crazy. So I thought she, I thought she put the best performance out there. Not to say that everybody else didn't do, because I think across the board everybody served their purpose. I think I haven't seen a Villeneuve movie yet where he hasn't utilized. A person correctly so um for, for me she stood out the most as far as like a dynamic character yeah i agree i think she was the best thing about the film um and it, it is it is such a head fuck because you're kind of like okay she she's clearly being programmed in certain ways but as the movie goes on you know she's the one who suggests to him look take me off the cloud put me on this you know on the emanator thing and he's like look are you sure so it's kind of like you're very confused as to what amount of volition she has and even at the end right when when love is about to stamp on her or whatever and kill her um see again i'm saying kill her it's it's not really that but the last thing she's trying to say to to ryan gosling's character is i love you and it's like well why would she say that she's a robot has she been programmed to say that or is she has she actually developed like some sort of artificial artificial intelligence how real is that artificial intelligence I, I don't know it's just it's brilliant it's wonderful to think of plus she's obviously really good looking she did a great job she seems to want to go the extra yard for for Kay's character with this whole threesome thing that she has with Mackenzie Davis's character is, is amazing and that's just like um I mean you've seen her right uh, in her, the, it's a very similar thing. You've got Scarlett Johansson's artificial intelligence, like Cortana, Siri-ish thing. And then she hires someone, like a physical prostitute to come, not prostitute, someone to come in. So it, it's really similar. I, I thought that was quite fascinating. Um, I love how they didn't align either, the kind of the, the sort of hologram and and the actual real person. They're slightly out of sync and that makes it even better. Uh, speaking of Mackenzie Davis, so like the only thing I've seen her in was that episode of uh, Black Mirror, San Junipero, which just won like a golden globe. So she was, she was one of the two principal actresses in that. She was fantastic in that. She was really good in this as well. Um, even though she didn't have much to do, I thought she, she it was kind of one of these ones. She, she was literally left like two lines yet somehow managed to kind of dominate the scene. Uh, I mean, how do you think she did? As no, I thought she was decent. She like, uh, there's this thing in, in, in modern criticism that it kind of, it's a pet peeve of mine where it's like, and, and I see it on Twitter, and it pisses me off. And I, I call and I, I call it the Boba Fett syndrome. And sometimes I think, and like and I'm not saying you're saying this when you were talking about like she had she didn't have enough to do, or she served a purpose. But I think sometimes people forget that supporting characters are meant to be supporting characters. Not everybody is meant to be like this three dimensional character. I mean, that's what the actor the actor brings in a sense of like lived in. That's what the actor's job is to do. Where if you have a script and a character is supposed to be like this to the main character, what the what the actor's job is is to bring a three dimensionality to a supporting character, and that's what the actor's job is. It's not necessarily, to, I mean, it's the director's job to an extent, but I'm hiring you. If I'm a director, I'm hiring you to to bring life to a character that may not have that much that may be on the paper at that point in right time. So when I see people sometimes saying, "Well, they didn't have a lot to do," and I'm not saying you said it on that part, but the way Twitter says it, or some of these people say it sometimes, I was like. If the actors, if, if the actor could bring more to that, like I use, I give you a prime example of going back to this is going to go back to like like machines, Robert Patrick and Terminator Two, and, he, and how iconic is he? If you look on a piece, if you look on a paper with the T the T one thousand, okay, he's just, he's just a stolid killer, but there's something that Robert Patrick brings to that role 
whatever whatever it is, and it's, it's almost ill-definable that that it takes on a whole other level. So I, I say that to say this about going back to the girl. So so she didn't do that much, but the role that she had to play, and she and she's part she's kind of part of the twist because you didn't know exactly where her loyalties lie when you first met her. So, and then when it goes to the end, so then you kind of like had a sympathy because now she was the face of that group that was protecting the um uh protecting Deckard's daughter, and then it, and then all of a sudden all the dominoes start falling in place. And like when you first see her, like you like you don't know who you don't know what her intentions is. So when you go back and watch the movie again, knowing what she is and what her duty was, all that stuff's going to take on a whole other color. And then you'll probably see more. Like 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 actor choices that will kind of like me go okay this and this and that and that's why I say with, with with the Blade Runner movies it's like one watch is not going to be enough so for for so for an initial watch like she served like she served her purpose in that role but I'm pretty sure that once I go back and watch it again with the information I know about her now I'm pretty sure there'll be ticks here and there and I trust Villeneuve as the director and her as an actor like you said we've seen before that I'm pretty sure more will go along right now but I guess for a first viewing she served her purpose. I think that's a great point that that she, it, it is that kind of rope a dope, isn't it? And but also, what the point I'd make is that I think there's clearly going to be a sequel. I reckon there'll be another one within. I don't think we're going to have to wait thirty five years either. To be honest, um, I can see some of these actors and actresses being incorporated again, and she, I could see her as maybe the lead of the next one if if her career goes pretty well. To be honest, because she's a pretty decent actress. Um, for, in the two things I've seen her. Um, you were mentioning about Terminator 2 and stuff like that. Uh, it's a great segue into the the actress who played Love, who is the kind of Terminator-ish replicant in this, uh, Sylvia Hooks. What did you think of her? I, the, the, at the end of her, like, like I said, this, this, is, this, is another, this, is, this is another this is another character where once you know what her motivation was, I mean, her, motiv- her motivation was kind of told at the beginning, but you don't, you didn't know how much it motivated her until like she made that statement to Kay at the end. But she she won me over the moment she saw what Jared Little's character was doing to the other replicant. How easily like even though he's like this well meaning guy, how little he thought of these replicants. Like okay, you're just you're just there to serve us, and he's and he's not doing it in like a vindictive way, but in a sense, he, I, but it's almost it's almost like see this is where. You can have a debate with his. This is gonna be funny because if you do watch Mother, we have a we have a podcast of Mother. It'll be very interesting to see what you, what what you think about his character and what Javier Bardem's character and Mother are like. It's, <laughs> I almost get. I almost want you to see it so bad so we can talk about that. But um, but yeah, going back to her, I think she like she's another one who served her purpose at the beginning. She had a motivation, but I feel I feel like this is a movie where with the supporting characters, there are gonna be a lot more things to take on more meaning once you watch it a second time. So it's very hard to say that the supporting characters were like mind blowingly fantastic. They're all they're all good, and there's not a single bad note among all the supporting characters. But I feel like this is a, a type of movie where it's like once you know where everybody's going, when you watch it again, all the minutia that Villeneuve is planted in these characters, making his point about memories and humanity and stuff like that, that stuff gets more and more out. But I think it's very hard for a movie like this and the way that it relies on like revelation to kind of like say that these guys. Like blew you away the first time you saw him, except for maybe joy, arguably. So, I mean, that's just my position. You might have a different way of thinking about it. Yeah, I think that's charitable, if I'm honest. I think I think Sylvia Hooks did a, a perfectly okay-ish job. Um, I think you could sub in someone like Numi Rapace, and we, we're going to talk about her in, in a future episode. Uh, she was in a film called What What Happened to Monday, and she was obviously in The Girl with a Dragon Tattoo, all that kind of stuff. The, the, Sylvia Hook seemed like a, a Numi Rapace light, if I'm honest. Um, a diet Numi. I just, I just don't think she was good enough. I just don't think she was good enough. She didn't have this presence on screen. Um, I don't think she was also handed enough in the script. If she, if she'd had that kind of explosion of motivation earlier, I think it would have made a lot more sense. And rewatching it, obviously, I don't know until I rewatch it, but I, I don't think I'm gonna particularly like her that much the second time round but uh, I just 
I don't know. I just if you put Numi Rapace in that role, I think she'd be a lot better. Put it that way. I, I just don't think the actress actress was perfectly serviceable, but I don't think she was stellar. And I think she was the weak link for me. I know that might seem a bit harsh, um, but I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure. And, and that's because I I disagree with you. I think there are lots of amazing performances from the supporting actresses and actors, like Robin Wright as uh, as Lieutenant Joshi. I think she was excellent. So nuanced. There were so many levels, even like a sort of sexual tension level, and uh, it was brilliant. And even the hairstyle kind of harkened back to to the original Blade Runner. Um, I think Carla Jury as as Doctor Anna, who ends up being Harrison Ford's daughter. I think she was really good, kind of really quirky. It reminded me of um, this actress from the eighties, the one who was in everything, like The Breakfast Club and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I can't I can't remember her name. It looked looked a bit visually like her. Um, I thought Dave Bautista was really good as Sapper Morton right at the beginning. Um, Jared Leto was was actually really good as as Neander Wallace as well, like although aided by kind of CGI. Um, I, I mean, stop me when you want to jump in on on a particular character. <laughs> oh no, my my no, my point basically, like I said, is like like I'm not saying they're, they're, they weren't. I think they're all great in the roles that they serve. I'm not I'm not saying like they weren't they weren't great or anything like that. I'm just saying like to me, it feels like. With this movie, it's like there's okay. I say this. With with this movie, I feel like it's like it's gonna be like the original Blade Runner, where it's like where it's like the 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 roles will get richer the more you watch it, as compared to like a typical movie where it's like like this. This is why I hate Academy Awards and shit like that. It's like I I I pretty much know what the Academy Awards go for. They go for like okay you. It's kind of like, and I kind of rebelled against this when I was in, when I was in, when I was a, when I was a lit, lit, like an English lit major in college. It's like that a spontaneous overflow of emotion. I know people are always all about like, if if if, I, if you didn't grab you emotionally, then it's it's not that. But I feel like Blade Runner is not a movie about um, um, emotions right away. I think Blade Runner is like, it's it, it's heady first, and it, the more you dive into it, the more it pulls emotion out of you. Whereas like a typical movie is kind of like, it hits you with the emotion right there, and then it goes on from there. So, cause I don't, I, cause if if I'm being honest, except for maybe, um, Rucker Howard's speech at the end of Blade Runner Run, like as great as I think that first movie is, I don't think I had any really um, strong emotional attachment to any of the characters, except for maybe that point right there. It, to me, I think it was more like a, like a, like a philosophical episode, exercise trapped within this groundbreaking vision. To me, I, when I think when I think of emotion, I don't think of Blade Runner. And I and that's why I said that's why I went when I go back to the um the the scene with the memory, and then there's and then and when we get to Harrison Ford, I'll talk about that scene right there too. I think between between that memory scene, what happens to Harrison Ford when he finally sees um Rachel again or the fake Rachel, and Rucker Howard's speech, I think those are the three times for me personally that I've gotten any like strong emotion out of um, Blade Runner, and then once I pulled those emotions out. I, I was able to work the rest of the movie back from those emotions that they pulled out of me, but that's just me. Well, I tell you what, we're, we're starting to run out of time now. So um, like you just said, let's cover the one remaining cast member. So Harrison Ford, um, how, how do you think uh, Deck had returned? Was it, was it positive? Was he on to screen too much or too little? No, he, he, to, to me, the, 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 the scene that made it worth it, then make bring Decker back. Like he was fine. Like I said, Decker's not one of my favorite Harrison Ford characters. Like he serves like for the move going back to the emotional thing. Like he's never I never had an emotional attack to attachment to Decker. But that one scene where they bring Rachel out, that brought out more emotion out of me for, for Decker's character than anything I've seen in any of the Blade Runner movies when it comes to him. So for me, that one scene made it worth it bringing Decker back. Like that was stuff beforehand. It was cool seeing him do like his old school Decker asshole stuff. With the, with the, when they're when they're at Las Vegas and you see like the elves in the background and all the Frank Sinatra stuff like that stuff is cool. That's like old school Decker. Like he's being a, this that classic Harrison Ford. I'm I'm the badass asshole. But then when you see this, when you see Rachel come out and I've seen I, I've seen things like how they did uh um uh Michael Douglas in uh, Ant Man how he made him look younger and how you made Robert Downey look younger in Civil War. But I think whatever technology they did to bring the old Rachel out, that was eerily creepy. They, I think if, 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 if that's not nailing that technology, then that's like 99.9999% close to, ma- to, 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 to mastering that technology. I was like, Jesus Christ. 
And the fact that the, te that the technology was as good as what it was to make it look like it was her back from 1975 or 79 or whatever that movie came out. I'm like, Jesus. And that pulled out. I think that scene right there for me made it worth bringing Decker back for me. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm going to count, well, not count, I'm going to say two Star Wars things to you. So, for, first of all, is Harrison Ford's Star Wars from Force Awakens. Uh, this this felt like so much of this was like what he'd just done in Force Awakens, except this was much better, basically. Uh, so, everything that he did in Force Awakens, this was done, but to a much higher level. Um, and, and also, even bringing back Sean Young as this, digital character that again was done in star wars in 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 rogue one um so i, I think the technology is definitely there now you know uh, i mean in rogue one there was an entire character the whole film who was cgi so it, it was and, and i barely even realized like after a minute i was like shit you know so um i don't know if it was completely necessary it was probably in terms of if you're looking at it thinking well she's only in it for like 30 seconds and they blow her brains out but but it, you're right it elicits the exact right emotional response from from um from deckard and i i don't know i think we were hanging around a bit too long for him and then when he came he was good i think he was good he was kind of also just like an old old guy i mean like what harrison's for how old is he now he's like 75 now for god's sake and he's still in pretty good shape to to be knocking around and stuff so um so i i think it i think it was pretty good um not perfect but but very good good enough <laughs> all right um i think that's pretty much all we've got time for um do you have any closing thoughts oh yeah so i was reading uh, i was reading the thing today I this one. and it's, it's interesting going back to saying what what other thing influenced this blade runner movie and it was funny because I was reading this article again and they were asking them, what were some of the influences that, that Blade was there? Of course, the Blade Runner. And then, this is interesting, and this is going to go back to your, this is going back to your villain thing. And this is the thing that I think when all is said and done with this other thing, the villain thing is going to, it's going to be interesting because I'm writing a long ass paper on this whole entire thing. So they asked him, what was another influence on this Blade Runner 2049? And then one of the writers said the, MC, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And I was like, okay. And he was like, He's like the thing that he's like the thing that that does so well that most of these blockbuster movies aren't doing well and not realizing is is that you have to build your you have to build your story from your character first and if your character is not strong then all this other fucking world building shit is a bunch of bullshit and it's like every, all the other outside characters have to serve that main character and that's pretty much the thing they took for him because Kevin Feige's design is like okay for for the longest time conventional wisdom is. Your hero is only good as your villain. Your hero is only good as your villain. Blah blah blah, like that. And this is going for a long time with Tim Burton and his and his Batman villains and this and that. But I think what is going on, especially in society right now, and this is going to be in my paper along as with it well, is that right now in our culture, and this goes to Trump and it goes to a whole lot of things around the world, is that the the biggest enemy to humanity is that own person. Like each of these people have to overcome their own personal things. So everything in that movie kind of services Kay's emotional journey. Whereas other movies were kind of like, okay, let's give equal time to the villain or give this and that. And I think that's what they made the choice about doing in this point. Of I'm kind of losing my point because we got to wrap it up soon. But it was just interesting to hear that the writer said that there was a, an influence. And they said, that's the thing that most blockbusters are getting wrong right now. Because when these, when these Marvel movies goes away, their main characters are going to be memorable to these people. It's not the villains. It's not the world building. It's that these beloved characters that when Infinity War comes out, is the people are going to see these characters. They're not going to see the badass villain. They're going to see these characters they grew in love and grew with. And I think that's the choice they made with Blade Runner. Like, okay, you make a point about the villain was lacking, but it was Kay's journey. And we're only going to focus on Kay's journey. Whereas in these movies, like they only focus, they focus on these guys. The villain's always going to come and go. And Age of Ultron, even the point was, the whole point of Ultron was like, villains come and go, but these people got to deal with their shit regardless. And I think that's the choice they made. And they said, that's what these other blockbusters get wrong, that those Marvel movies get right. And I was really impressed to see somebody as as sophisticated as those writers and those directors kind of pull something from that, that these blockbusters, other blockbusters are getting. And I was like, holy shit, that's impressive. So I thought that was interesting, that they made that philosophical choice on how to tell a story. Yeah, I think that's a philosophical choice. I don't think it's it's right or wrong, but... 
For me, for me personally, I prefer like a strong villain nine times out of ten. Um, I mean, just just look at Star Wars, you know. Okay, well, that was great. Uh, do you know what? I've absolutely loved talking about Blade Runner 2049. I'm going to continue to read it when it comes out. I'm going to buy it, um, which is not the initial reaction I had heading back to my car last night. So I'm delighted that after 24 hours, I've soaked it in. Um, so don't forget to find us on Facebook under Transatlantic Rebels and on Twitter at T underscore Rebels. And we're going to go. All right, peace. Peace.